Okay, and we're live. So, today is arguably one of our more important lectures. Just give me a moment, I'm going to turn on my GoPro. And, okay, we are recording. Today is arguably one of our more important topics we're going to be covering. And uh, this will be on the exam next week, so take notes or yeah, better to take notes or the video will be on YouTube. So, yeah. <laughs> or you can watch it again on YouTube if you'd like. And uh, yeah, so this is a, we're going to be talking about values of performing arts and the way they've been classified. Okay, so this is based upon a uh, paper I translated for Igusti uh, Muras Ramasahra. He's the uh, uh, Vice Rector 2 at the University at EC Denpasar, where we are here. And uh, he's actually a historian, is his background. And he's, he's really, uh, he has a really interesting take on things because he's looking at things more through a historical perspective than uh, through a performing arts perspective. Because very often the performing arts perspective is more concerned with aesthetics. Uh, when we're talking about Balinese art. So he's less concerned with the aesthetic than he is the actual empirical history of what's going on in these in these art forms and the way, they're, the way they've been affected through tourism. So really what we're getting at is the development of the performing arts in the face of tourism. Uh, and he goes back in his paper, he goes back to the 1920s. We're going to kind of we're going to start where we are now, in the middle of what's going on, move back to the 1920s, work our way back up, and then we're going to, uh, yeah, talk about some stuff that might happen next, too. Okay, so, let's see here, the, the title of this lecture is Balinese Performing Arts, Wali, Babali, and Babali Balihad. So, hello, when uh, you have questions, just like raise your hand and I may or may not right away answer the question, or I might continue to, uh, because maybe I might uh, answer the question before it comes up, because there's going to be a lot. We're taking things that you guys have learned, because now you guys have been here for six months. Six months now, isn't it, yeah? Coming on six months, yeah? So now that you guys have been here for this long, you guys have got a great handle of what's going on here, and now we're kind of going to go further into it. And this lecture will confuse you a little bit at the beginning, and by the end, you will understand what's going on. So just uh, bear with me. This is going to be a roller coaster ride in terminologies. So we're talking about uh, new terminologies here. Wali, Wali, Babali, and Bali Bali Ha. That's the fun one to say. Bali Bali Ha. So this is a classification system for the arts that was created, or should I say, is the findings and results of a seminar from March 24th, 25th, 1971. I believe it was right here where the seminar was held. Because it was addressing uh, the performing arts in the face of tourism and commodification of the performing arts and uh, uh, what should we say, secularization of sacred forms and not just secularization but commodification of these sacred art forms. So that's kind of what we're going to get into today and it's really, really important to have a handle on to get your perspective on the performing arts and kind of the arts that you're performing right now, that you're learning, where they sit in uh, the grand scheme of things. So, what, what is it? Yeah, it's Wali, Mabali, and Mabali, Mabali. I'm just going to kind of unpack this. This is, uh, this is all taken from the paper that I translated by Igusti Muras Ramasahra. And I'm just going to kind of unpack it. So we have here, uh, the religion and traditional performing arts in Bali are inseparable. So there are, performing arts are an integral part of the religion and day-to-day -day practices of the Balinese people. And which is why there exists an emphasis on sustaining these performing arts. And these performing arts will never disappear. Yes? Are we going to have these? Are we going to make these? Uh, oh, the slide and presentation? 
Uh, no, but you can get it from YouTube. It's, uh, it's on YouTube right now, and we'll stay up there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so take notes as you're going along, things that you think are important to remember. So, yeah, we're not going to lose art forms like Wayak in Valley. We don't have to worry about that because the day-to-day -day religious life of the people involves Wayak. You can't have certain ceremonies without Wayak. It's, an, it's, necess it's a necessity. But because of that, it's sustainable and it regenerates itself. It just keeps going. And so we don't have to worry about that. But what we do have to worry about is the balance in sustaining commercial value of the performing arts along with the symbolic religious value of the performing arts. Because sometimes, as we're going to see throughout this presentation today, they crash, right? And it can be detrimental to the art and the way it's represented, or it's on uh, monetary gain rather than this, uh, this spiritual uh, existence of this, of this particular art form. Yes? Uh, I was just article yesterday about okay. this uh, law that has been proposed about banning outside influences on art, on music. So like apparently K-pop's ruining Balinese music and so there's this proposal in the government to restrict creative freedom uh, in the music world. And then I was also reading this other article that yeah. came up that was saying, you know, oh like tourist industry, blah, 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 should be so focused on the cultural aspects and more focused on the beach. And, you know, like, uh, yeah, it just pulls into to all this stuff about, like, what's what's the draw, what, what matters, what's important. Um, yeah. You know. And you're digging right into exactly what we're talking about today, right? Like, that is exactly what we're talking about because You'll read that article where it says we shouldn't be focusing on the cultural tourism industry. We should be focusing on the beach. But I mean, it's bullshit. yeah, yeah, it is, it, well, it is bullshit, right? Because Valley's tourism industry came from cultural tourism. This is where we're going to backtrack after we kind of do this, uh, this background, this overview of what's going on. We're going to show how tourism in Valley is because of culture. It's not because of the beaches. It's not because of the mountains. You can go anywhere in the world and find nicer beaches. You can go anywhere in the world and find nicer mountains. You know, it's like, it's not because of that that Valley has the tourism industry. It does, because of the culture. And that's how it started. And that's why it's still here. And exactly like Lydia said, we're going to dig right into that today. And we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to start with this year, for those of you that just arrived, we have these three, class, this classification system for performing arts. These three terms, Wali, Vavali, and Vavali Vali Ha. And we're going to talk about that. This, these were the findings or the results of a seminar on March 24th and March 25th, 1971. And uh, they, what they did was talking about tourism and its impact on the performing arts and the secularization of sacred art forms. Uh, <clears throat> they came up with these three classification systems in order to, in order to protect outside influence on performing arts when it comes to uh, modification and monetary gain because there had already been several art forms that were highly sacred art forms that had become uh, commodified and turned into tourist attractions. So this was a way of allowing that to still happen but differentiating what is a tourist attraction, a commodified version of something and what is its actual form. And as we go on, this is going to be a long lecture today, but as we go on we're going to get further into it. So. It's about that balance, like we talked about last week with Roa Bine Dub, right? It's, it's about maintaining that balance, and that's what this whole, this, whole, uh, this whole seminar in 1971 was about. So, uh, I like this, I took it from the paper I translated. It says, cultural ideology, ideologies, that is, classifications of performing arts and cultural tourism must be utilized to alleviate the potential negative impacts of tourism in Balinese Hindu life. Right? So it's really talking about what Lydia was just mentioning. Tourism is talking about the influence of outside art forms like, like K-pop, right? And it's like, how can we say we can make K-pop illegal, right? Like that's kind of kind of preposterous in its, in its in its train of thought. But it comes from 
Yeah, it comes from this, this, this need to alleviate potential negative impacts. However, a system for that already exists. So when someone writes this article, and uh, I, I read something similar to that, or probably the same one, about the influence of K-pop, and I was like, they already did this in 1971, we don't have to worry about that, right? Like, they've done this a long time ago, so we don't really have to worry about what K-pop is doing to Balinese art form, because it's really not negatively impacting it in any way. It's just kind of existing, right? But I think, you know, in general, the other part that I read in the article was like they were, like Lady Gaga had to cancel her tour in Jakarta because like all these Islamic extremists like were threatening to basically beat her up if she got off the airplane. You know, so I think there is this other aspect of like the sex sexualization of of music and art that's also being rejected by conservative culture. Yeah, and there's a lot of fundamentalism at the at the, the heart of that, which. Which it, that that part there, that's in itself another lecture, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. yeah. But, you know, but there is, you know. There's overlap. Like, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It over it overlaps. Yeah. So that's what we're getting into today. Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna turn my GoPro back on here. And it is alive again. Okay. Good. So. Hinduism in Bali is not just a belief in God, right? You guys, we've all been here long enough to know that it's not just a belief in God. It's a framework for everyday behavior and social interaction. We have these ideas of Roa Bine Da, Priyata Karana, Sri Kaya Parisuda, Sri Guna, and all these things we've been talking about over the course of the last uh, six months. And we know that it's, it's, not just, it's not just saying, I'm a Hindu because I believe in God. It's, it's a behavioral framework for the people, this idea of tatua masi, that is me, right, and things like that. So, <clears throat> it's not just, it's not just that belief in God, it's teaching the concrete aspects essential to achieving prosperity, right? Like these concepts we've been talking uh, about for the last six months. So, this is a, this, these above, these goals are achieved by carrying out these religious ceremonies. So this is when things are going to start to get very uh, confusing in terms of terminology, in ter terminologies that we've learned so far. So we all know the word in Indonesian for ceremony, upacara, right? You'll see like it says on the road, the road sign says hati hati, ada upacara adat, or ada upacara agama, right? So we know upacara means ceremony. Actually, uh, we're going to kind of unpack that and turn upacara into two terms because the word Kupachara is from Bahasa Indonesia, and then in Bahasa Bali, of course, it's kind of a non sequitur, or there's overlap involved in it. So I kind of took this quote because I really, really like this and it's important. Uh, the development of tourism-based initiatives promoted by the local government of Bali is a concrete effort in the realization of prosperity. However, it must be adapted to teachings of religion and culture of Bali. Right, so it's, it's always, it's adaptive is the key word in there. Adaptive and the balance. Okay, here's these two new terms, or well, we have one word we've heard, upachara, but we have upakara and upachara. They're actually two elements of a ceremony. So we have the word for ceremony, upachara, in Bahasa Indonesia. Oftentimes in Bali, they'll say a ceremony, they'll say the word makariya, which actually means work. Right? They'll be like, oh, someone's having a ceremony, they might say, oh, I'm not right? I mean, it, it, it literally translates to work, right? Like, it's like, and uh, so they won't always use the word upachara for ceremony because upachara is an element of ceremony. There's these two elements, upachara and upakara. And this is really important to know and it's confusing. It's going to be really confusing, but we're going to go into it and it will become clear throughout the duration of this lecture. So, it's two main unions, and they have their own distinctions, and become and have and these distinctions have become the main attractions in tourism. So, according to Presidential Instruction Number Nine of 1969 on tourism developers in Indonesia, as an effort to increase the country's division, chose Bali to be a top priority as a tourist area. Presidential Instruction Number Nine hinted 
to the development of tourism, the tourism industry, so naturally there were concerns for public figures, intellectuals, and artists in the cultural sector in regards to the extinction of Balinese culture due to its commodification as an industry and merchandise, which we have, it's been, it's been very clear over the years that there are, yes, of course, like in any culture, certain art forms have become extinct, right? Maybe, or certain, uh, certain maybe works of art within certain art forms have become extinct. For example, Smaka Bulingan isn't extinct. It's a type of gamelan that's still booming and still happening, but there, of course, are songs within the Smaka Bulingan repertoire that have become extinct. And yes, but we are not losing Smaka Bulingan anytime soon. So that was in 1969. We're backtracking. We're going to go back to 1920 and then jump back ahead again. <clears throat> so we have to remember these in the worship of God, the Balinese Hindus, for the Balinese Hindus, contains two main elements, Upachara and Upakara. So I kind of here organize them. <laughs> I kind of here organize them into a table here. To differentiate, because we've heard the word Upachara more often, uh, I'm going to kind of uh, focus on Upakara for a minute here. So the elements of Upakara are the elements associated with different type, types of offer, offerings. So the Bantana, like the Chana. The Chana itself is Upakara. The object is, technically it's a ceremony in itself when you think about it, because when you see wherever you live, when you see people putting out the chanan, you guys know the chanan sari, the square offering of different various types of flowers in it and uh, different offerings within it, right? When they put that out, they do, they have like a, a blessing for it and they put the, the holy water on it, right? So there is a small ceremony happening there. That's its own, that's its own little tiny ceremony. So these elements of Upakara have their own ceremony within ceremony happening, right? It's, it's, it becomes, yeah, it becomes kind of meta, right? And these are the micro elements as we move into the macro. And then, besides these types of bhaktan, these types of offerings, we have performing arts that are actually considered a ceremony unto themselves. So those ones we classify as wali. And we'll get talking about which ones are wali, which ones are babali, and then babali bali hadu as we move along. And then the Upachara elements are the ones that hold more emphasis on supporting what's going on. The ceremony, what this Makariyo can say can happen if that's not there. But if that's there, it puts emphasis on supporting what's going on. Those are the ones we call Bubali. Okay, so those are in terms of performing arts. So let's keep going. Wali is the Upakara. Okay. Wali is the Upakara, the ones that are required. So the you need to have the object of this object ceremony. Yeah, exactly. The Chanan, for example, for certain ceremonies, you must have Baris Kade. You must have a Rajan dance. Those would be considered Upakara. I thought you said the Bali was the performance There are performing arts that are in Bali. And there are that are in Bubali. So Bubali is the supporting aspect. They would be Upachara. So a dance such as uh, the Duong dance would be considered a Bubali dance because it's a more of a supporting aspect of it. But the dance such as the uh, Barish Kide or Rajang dance are considered Upachara. So they are an essential element that must happen during this, this Mukar Yoga. Bali is the essential, the Bali is supporting. That's, yeah, that's a good way of putting it, yeah. Yeah, they're supporting elements, yeah. Exactly, yeah, I like that. So, and then this is kind of a side note, but the performing arts are a social system within themselves, right? Like, think back to before Bali was a part of Indonesia, think back to when it was, you know, monarchies, right? These were ways of organizing the community. Right? This is delegating work for people to do, not just the performing arts. All of these art forms are ways of organizing the community and delegating work for people to do. It gives people uh, 
it gives people, okay, my job is to make the chanan, my job is to, uh, my job is to perform in the bares dance, and so it becomes a system of social organization as well as, uh, as well as this uh, <coughs> sacred duty that we're talking about. So there are implications of organizing the social system around the performing arts. So that's what we're getting into, is the performing arts as an offering. Right? So in certain, in carrying out the Odalan ceremonies, Odalan is the anniversary of the temple that we talked about, uh, Mabantan or Ubakaranya, so these Ubakara are always equipped with various types of performing arts that are sacred to the people of Bali. In accordance to uh, Alonta, called Mabantan Plutu, performing arts that exist that are sacred to the Balinese people are the Jan, Tendet, Baris, Kopeng Sidakaria, and Wayalama, among others, because remember, we have Desakalapatra, right? So in some places, a performing art form would be considered Wali, whereas in other places, that might be a Bali art form. So that's when we have the overlap of where we are is where we're going to be performing these certain art forms. But in those places when, for example, Wayang Wong, uh, the Wayang that uses people performing, in those places it's considered a sacred art form, a Wali art form, but in other places it is not it's considered a Bali. So it's based upon, yeah, Desa Kalapatra, the place, time, and situation. So this is all based upon the results of a seminar in March 20, sorry, I was wrong in my dates, March 25th and 26th, not 24th and 25th, in 1971. And these types of arts that are mentioned on that caption above are considered Wali, among, among others. We're going to get into this now. So we're going to look at some of the, these art forms. So we have here, this is uh, Dewa Wijaksana. He's a uh, teacher in the Wayang department here at Isidan Basar. He is very well known for Wayang Lama and also Wayang Sapulagea, uh, which is a type of Wayang and a book that he wrote that is considered for students of Dalangan. That's like one of the holy bibles for the students, you know, like that's like their that's like their sacred text for them. It's a really important book and uh, a printing of it has recently been published again. If anyone's interested in buying it, I could help you get a hold of it because I want to buy it myself. By the way, the tax book is coming, yeah. <laughs> it's coming, yeah. It's difficult to find, it's difficult to find uh DBL sometimes because he's a very busy man, yeah, but I have mentioned it and it's coming. So yes, and then another book, very important book, especially for students of Wayang, is Sapu Legea, Wayang Sapu Legea by Niwa Wichatsana. And Wayang Lama is considered one of these Wali art forms. So it's a lot different than the Wayang we watched last week. Or that was one that we actually made for tourists, right? Like this is when this is when things start to hop around, and we'll get that's when we'll get into how the system gets very complicated. But nonetheless, it is a system that works. So sorry, I, yeah. I missed the really the most important word. Which is the one that was made for tourists? The one that we did last week in the Robo Bineda lecture. The one that we did in English. We made another way in, in, in English. There were no sacred connotations to that. We were just taking a story from uh, from Mahabharata and turning it into a Wayang, uh, Wayang puppetry for tourists, yeah. Okay, and then here's another one. Probably the easiest example to, to find and to see why it is considered Upakara unto itself. Topeng Sinakarya. So in the Topeng cycle, we have Usually it starts with Topeng Kras, and then after that we have Topeng Tua comes out. So we have Kras is kind of like the junior advisor, Topeng Tua is the senior advisor, then Topeng Dalam comes out, the king figure, right? And then after that, usually we kill and Punta, the two brothers that kind of do a modress bit that kind of replace the later years or earlier years, they had a Topeng Bondress that was kind of after the and done we deal a bit and would interact with the two of them. And then at the end of the whole cycle is Siddhakarya. The Siddhakarya element is the Upakara. 
Oftentimes people will call Topeng Sida Kariya. They'll oftentimes just call it Topeng Wali. Like in ser- you'll be at a ceremony and be like, oh, you ask them like, what kind of arts or room am I gonna get to see today? And they're like, oh, we have Topeng Wali. When they say we have Topeng Wali, they mean we have Topeng Sida Kariya because of the fact that you watch Topeng Sita Kariyo, he's not really dancing a whole lot, right? The, the person performing it isn't really dancing a whole lot. What they're doing is they're walking around the premises, wherever the ceremony's happening, right? It's, it's in someone's home. They walk around the home and they're, they're sprinkling holy water around the home and kind of purifying the home, right? Like, so that is the Topeng Sita Kariyo dance. There isn't a whole lot of dance movement and expert movement involved in Topek Sita Kariyo, and you have to have a certain religious status in order to do it, right? You have to be approved as someone who's allowed to perform that Topek Sita Kariyo. It couldn't just be like, oh, I decided I'm going to learn Topek, and tomorrow I'm going to learn Topek Sita Kariyo, right? It, it, I couldn't just do that. I need to be, I need to have been approved in some form or another have some sort of uh, spiritual approval from my peers and from others to say that I'm able to perform that art form, right? So that's a really good example of Wali. It's my, it's by far my favorite because it's the easiest one to see when it's performed. You can see that this is unto itself, even though there's a big ceremony happening, on the micro level, you can see Tobeng Sita Kariyo as its own ceremony within the ceremony. That's where we have that Wali element, that Upakara. And then here's another one. This is Bari Skide. You guys have learned that this year, yeah? With Pak Kwayan Budiaksa. Bari Skide is a, uh, another example of Kari Upakara. It's, uh, this is a picture uh, at Pura Batur in 2017, I believe. And this is the group from EC where we will be going to this same ceremony, Batara Turun Kabe, at Kurulun Danu Batur. With EC, we will be going, and those of you that are interested will be more than welcome to join in performing Bariskade or the Rajan dance. So they will be performing Rajan Dewa, I believe it will be Rajan Dewa, and Bariskade, as we usually do every year. I'm sorry. Yes. So you mean um, we are students with the local students. Yeah, yeah. You'll probably be, yeah, some of you, you know, now it will probably be up to your teachers to choose which one of which ones of you know the dance well enough to perform, right? Or if you ask the teachers you really you're really interested in performing, you know, like but you will be there and you'll be playing gamelan at the ceremony. That happens in April, I believe. See, I'm not sure this year because we have the whole Panchawali Krama happening, the one that happens once every 10 years. So I don't, I have to read, I just got the book from uh, the Kurobasaki committee. So I mean, like, I have to read the book to find out exactly when, but probably in April. The, the 10 year ceremony is, is huge. Yeah, it's happening, yeah, in many temples all over the valley. Yeah, it's like, but especially in Batu. In Bisake, it's kind of the, the, head, the head of where it's happening, yeah, the mother temple. And then there's a map in the in the book from the from the committee about all the other temples it's happening. It's very complicated. Like I really I'm gonna be honest, I don't understand how it works. When is it? It's already started. It started January twentieth. People weren't allowed to have cremation ceremonies anymore until after the Panchawali Krama ceremony that is in April, it ends in April. So, which is very unique also, this is the first time since I've been in Bali that I haven't seen Naben happening, the cremation ceremony. So this is very, you guys are here for a very cool year. You guys picked the perfect year or just happened to come across the perfect year to be in Dharma Sisla, yeah. And uh, so this is another example in this village, Desa Pundalam, of Wan Wong that you're talking about. So in some places it's considered a Wali art form, in other places it's considered a Bali art form, and it's both Wali and commodified. Like in Bondalam, in Buleleng, uh, in uh, Tejikula Buleleng, they have a commodified version of it too, although it is a highly sacred art form too. So that's why I'm Wong, the one that is with the people doing Wayan stories, basically. Uh, so Tari Pendet, this is one that I found interesting when I was learning about this concept because 
How to command death. You guys are learning that one with Budayu Vibhava right now, I believe. Or you already did, yeah? Well, this is one that is considered Wali, according to that Lontaro that we were talking about, about dances that are considered Upakara. Until I had learned about this, I thought that Tari Pandev was just like a regular welcome dance used at formal events, right? Because that's how we've seen it, you know? It's considered a Tari Sambutan that is used at different events to welcome, like, whoever's there. You know, like when they have the dignified guests come, they do a Tari Pandev. It's actually uh, it's actually considered a ceremony unto itself. So, once again, why is that? Uh, for a good reason, you can see why. It's very evident in the picture. You can see they're holding a bantan, an offering. Could have something to do with it, right? <laughs> like, you know, kind of makes sense. And uh, I thought it was just a welcome dance that was used for a very long time until I found out that no, this is actually considered Ubakara. This is Wali. But the way it's used, it's kind of been used as Bali Bali Ad. Because, I mean, when they welcome a guest to a seminar and they use Kari Pendet, there is no, there is no Wali element to it. It's been, it's been, it's jumped over to Bali Bali Ad. These are the ones that are for, uh, yeah, for tourist functions and other functions like that. For uh, things that don't have a religious uh, connotation to the, to the event. Okay, and then here's another one. I picked this one. All the jazz, all for a jazz dances are considered Ubakara. I picked this one because I've been watching, trying to keep the finger on the pulse of what's going on lately. And everyone knows that Rajan Red Tang is like everywhere, right? Like you guys have seen that everywhere. It's been the first time I was here in 2015. It was around, but it wasn't as popular. And then I came back in 2016, and it was like exploding. Right? And then more and more and more. And then now I'm kind of noticing that less people are doing what a jang rain tang is. I've heard a lot of my, even my friends in my class have said to me, you know, they'll say like, oh, booming or a jang rain tang jani. And that means like the whole world is doing a jang rain tang right now, right? So they're kind of, there's a, a, a bounce back to, they're going to, because there's, I don't know, like at least, there must be around 20, around 20 types of rajang, you know, okay. at least more than 10, right? Like, there's a lot. And this is one that I've noticed is kind of starting to appear more often. Who knows? Maybe it has the same qualities as Rajan Renjang in terms of the fact that the movements aren't so complicated. It's one danced by women who are uh, already mature. And so it, it could be the next big thing. I don't know, right? Like it could, could be the next uh, Rajan Renjang that's happening. And, but anyway, that's just kind of me trying to make a prediction and I'm probably going to be wrong. You know, something will come up. Yeah, but, uh, something might come up, but I'm just noticing that there's an increase in the Rajang Sahari happening right now. And it's very similar to the Rajang Rene The Gamelon is really fun to play. It has, the, the movements are quite simple for the dancers to do. And the availability of dancers to do it is quite uh, easy to find. Okay, and then here's another one, Sanghyang Le Gong. So, before Le Gong was considered a female dance, Le Gong was a male dance. Uh, Ibu Dayu Wimba's son, Ida Bagos Surya Pradanha, he wrote an article that I translated about the origins of Le Gong in Sukhawati, and it was a mask dance for men. It was performed by men because in that region, Women weren't allowed to perform dances until 1929, it said in his article. So that means that all these dances that were female characters were performed by men, which is still a very, very common feature of these cross-dressing characters, right? Like these, these, these characters of men playing, playing females. And a lot of men are considered, when you can do one of these parts, you're considered to be quite mastered in the dance art form because you're able to do these female dances, and you can do these male dances also. Like my teacher and my comedy partner, uh, and he's like my number one important for my thesis, and we're starting co-writing a book about Guam Dress right now. He is most well known for doing uh, Matri Manis and Matri Buduk dance, right? Which is a uh, just crazy and sweet princess dance, right? Like he's really famous for it, you know? Like he's really good at it. And uh, what's up? 
So it's from uh, Joe, right? And they have, there's two of them, Rodo Obide Dub, right? It's a, it's a princess character and can be, well, how a princess stereotypically would act, right? Like, and then Manis, the Man Manis character would be, Manis means sweet, right? So like the movements are, the movements are more, if yes, smooth in their, in their form. And then the Bodo is, Bodo means crazy, right? So it's like then she's crazy and the movements would probably be more crass and uh, yeah, and more kind of jerking fast movements in, in that. And it's kind of, yeah, it's the reason why that now oftentimes it's performed by women. It's just when the dance, when, when it was part of the Ardo, uh, genre, it was just uh, performed by men because only men performed during that time. I've yeah. seen it done a few times with with men in, you know, a, a mixed gender cast. Yeah. So I'm like, why are they, like, is it historical that they chose to do this or is it just like so extreme because the character is usually like really over the top, you know, and it's going around like, you know, fucking with people and making out with the king. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Something all the scandal. I'm like, this is really interesting. It's one of my favorite characters to watch, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that they, you know, they, like, save space for, like, this moment of cross-dressing. Like, I just, um, I'm just, like, really curious about like, Yeah, it's, it's a character in the play. And now it's often used in Bon Dress. Because, I mean, through the evolution of art forms in Bon Dress, that's a really funny character from Ardo. And... Oftentimes, I will perform with uh, a friend that is doing that Mansuri Manis or Mansuri Bodo character, or sometimes both will be on stage in the Bon Res show. And it was it, it was because they had female characters, but females were not were not allowed to dance at the time. So it was men playing women, and it was very common and actually considered a very skilled trait of a man being able to play a play a woman because you have to move like a woman can. And uh, you had to you had to be able to do that. So you had to know all these all these dances that were considered female, even though women were dancing at that time. Yeah, it's very very interesting but character. They are now. Yeah, but they are now, and they do those dances now. So now it's kind of and then after that, so this is kind of what's cool about you mentioning that. If I, has anyone met Cordy? He was from the states. He's my buddy. From, yeah, you know Cordy. Yeah. He was playing in a gamelong group that was playing the accompanying music to a transgender Legong group. So it was all men that had had... Well, that was in 2014? 2016 he was playing with it, I believe. And uh, what's cool about that is you can see the Legong form coming full circle in that, right? Because it was originally performed, or performed by men wearing a mask playing women, and then became women dancing Legong, and then uh, it became a transgender group playing it, right? They were performing at uh, the Valley Arts Festival too. Yeah, yeah uh, they, 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 they do like uh, quite often, yeah. They're, and they're, Courtney said it was just a riot performing with them, you know. You see, I remember the stories you told me, right? It's like, because they're, they're really like really over the top in their everyday, everyday lives, right? Like the people from that group. Uh, I know one of them, I've performed, I've performed with them. Uh, De Gung from Akacha Ging, very, very funny character. It's like, just in everyday life, just funny. Just extremely funny, funny character. But are they just um, cross-dressing for that part, or is that an actual part of their daily expression? So, with these, with this group that is the transgender Legong group, that's an actual part of their daily expression, this transgender Legong group, whereas with my teacher and my comedy partner, he is just doing it for that part. Like he, he will change, like instantly. Like he goes on stage, he becomes a different person, and then comes off stage and becomes. Where is that dance teacher based out of? I, I believe the transgender Lego group is based out of Sat Ding, but I'm not sure. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because that's where Cordy was staying. Yeah. I believe they're based out of Sat Ding. Do you know the name of it? I don't. I don't remember the name of it. Uh, but I believe they're out of Sat Ding. Danica, Danica, yeah, ask ask him, the okay, guy uh, from Sanding, yeah, he'll know for sure, yeah. Okay, good, so we have that with the Legong, the Sanghyang Legong. Remember, Sanghyang is the root of Kechak also, right? So we're going to get into this. Okay, so now 
we've gone over some of these Kumbakara art forms, like uh, we, we did with uh, those ones there. Now we're going to get into Upachara art forms. These ones that are considered supporting elements of the performance. So we have Wayang Wong, which has overlap because in some places Wayang Wong is considered sacred, it's considered, uh, it's considered supporting elements, some places it's considered both. Some places it goes into all three. Some art forms will fit into all three depending on where you are and what's happening at the time. So we have Wayang Wong, uh, Gambu is a great Gambu is a great one because uh, that's kind of like the original uh, popular entertainment, right? Like that was the original popular entertainment of people. They had touring troops of Gambu troops, right? They would tour all around Bali, very very popular. And then Abjo, which is uh, I mean, we want to talk about popular place for. Out of Joe, that's Singapadu, where Pak Divya is from, right? Like they are, they're a dynasty of Out of Joe players. That was, once again, popular entertainment, and then they go on. These can all be called a ballet. And then these ones can very easily be converted into Bali Bali Han or Bali Bali Han uh, for the benefit of tourism. They're very easy to do, to turn, to turn into something for the benefit of tourism, whereas it's kind of more risky and treading into dangerous waters when you're doing that with Bali Air Force. And sometimes they're just like, no, you cannot do that. Like, you cannot take Bali Ski Day and sell tickets for it. No, you're just not allowed to do that. Rajang, you cannot take Rajang and sell tickets for it. We'll get into that in a minute, too, actually. Or we can go into it right now. I don't have the video for it, and the, on YouTube right now, I probably shouldn't play the video for it. Someone else owns the video for it. And, uh, but, there, what happened recently in Tanah Loa? Did anyone hear about the Rajan Sanat Ratu Sugara that happened in Tanah Loa? Uh, it was, uh, I, guess, I think, I believe it was, you guys were here at the time, but like just here. And what happened was Ibu Eka, the Bupati of Tabanan, decided to set a world record and have a Rajan dance stage for. 1,800 young girls from schools all around the Tabanan Regency at Tanah Loa and set a record for the world's largest Rajan dance. And they did it, and they performed a piece called Rajan Sanda Ratu Sugara, and something very interesting happened during the performance. Hundreds of girls went into trance, right? Like really violent trance, hundreds of girls. Like it was like insane. And there's videos, there's viral videos all over the internet of it happening, right? Not only did that happen at the event, it happened for months after it. For months, it was all over the internet. Girls would just be sitting in class in school, then all of a sudden, wah, just freak out, lose it, start speaking Bahasa Kaui out of nowhere, right? It's like, there's like, and they're in trance, and they're just like, yeah, it was, what's up? Old Japanese, the, the performing arts language, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it was very, very strange, and in some cases very, in some cases funny, too, you know, it was actually, in some cases quite funny, and there was a lot of entrainment involved in it, too, so there was a lot of people's, like, someone's friend goes into trance, and then other people go into trance, because it's like, well, we all go into trance, right, like, there's that phenomenon of entrainment happening, but it happened for months, and a lot of people said, well, the reason why this happened is because Rajan is Upakara. You gotta, if you're a tourist and you're going to Tanah Loa, you gotta buy tickets to go to Tanah Loa, and you're selling tickets to Rajak. You know, and that was that was the the ultimate reason that people came up with for why this happened. And, but doesn't that also happen just because something is um, so sacred in a positive way? Like, but, like I, I was at this temple ceremony in December, and. It was a two-day event, and the first day, yeah, they had the Rajang, and then the next day, um, like, at the end of every piece, somebody in the audience was going. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then at the end, the Kopeng Dalan, he just goes like this, and the whole front row goes out. Yeah. And then suddenly there's, like, 20 women in trance, but that's not because they, like, did something wrong. No, that's right. That's, that's because it was just... Spirit possession, I suppose you would call it in that in those terms. And 
that's a normal part of that's a normal part of a ceremony when you're out. It's a very very normal part of a ballet ceremony. But to have 20 people, even the ballets were freaking out. Yeah, but it's still it's still kind of like when you have that many, right? And then all of a sudden when you have hundreds, right? It's like, yeah, it's like this is like it was kind of freaky, right? People were just like, okay, yeah, and then it was like right at the end of the dance, just like so many of them just like lost it, went into trance and. You can see videos if you look it up. Uh, just look up with a jacket on a lot on YouTube, Instagram, and it's 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 quite frightening and yeah yeah sometimes comical because number one there was no ceremony happening it was just a festival number two they were trying to set a world record number three they were selling tickets to a uh, jacket so just why that happened which is an example of when you when you take Wally art forms. It's possible that that can happen with certain certain types of them. That seems to be the the going belief of what happens. But then you have, as we'll get into, other forms where it's been absolutely no problem. So what we have here. This is a different place where there's very popular Wayang Wong in Talapud uh, in Hamak Ring. I've been to the Sangar here. It's called Sangar, called Sangar Jerogadik Bayan. They have a great Wayang Wong uh, Sangha, and they right now are working on training a new generation of Wayang Wong performers because they used to every year, twice a year, go to Paris to perform Wayang Wong, and their sponsor passed away because I mean, a Sangha and the people supporting a Sangha, they age, right? Like it's part of a thing, their sponsor passed away, members of their Sangha, performers in their group passed away also. And now they're working on training up a younger generation. So they have now they have a, a Wang Wong for kids that they perform every year at the Ballet Arts Festival, which is really cool. And that's them performing at Ayodhya. Yeah, Le Gong, as we spoke about before, the as some of the evolution of Le Gong as an art form we have here. I just put up a picture of Le Gong Kung Tu, uh, and there's over 20 different kinds of Le Gong. I, don't, I can't name them all, right? Like, I, I just can't. But there's over 20 different kinds, and this is one that imitates the aesthetic of birds. Le Gong Kung Tul. Udai Wimba is the teacher of Le Gong Kung Tul. She's really an expert in that. And then here we have Gambul. This was a traveling art form, right? This was a traveling popular entertainment art form, which explains why the ensemble is a lot smaller. They, uh, they have, you know, Flutes and a few gongs, and it is carrying a jiggle gun, you know, to every village you go to, right? Yeah. And uh, this was a this was a very popular. It still, it still is in some places, right? Like a very popular entertainment form. Arjo, like we were talking about before. Some people call Arjo Balinese opera, right? Like I, I guess you know, like it's Arjo is uh, usually a story with three chapters, right? Three parts. There is conflict. Playing around the conflict and a resolution to the conflict. It has, I think, minimum 11 stock characters, and you'll see, you'll see, like the Manfri Manis, Manfri Kudu, you'll see Kunta and Mijil, versions of the Manis and Kudu. So it takes up six, and then there's Desak Rai, which is like the uh, evil one, and then there's, there's all sorts of, but I mean, the story's changed. Desak Rai isn't always necessarily the evil one. They, they have changing stories and the people write stories for it. And often what's cool about it is they'll come up with like a bare bones idea of a story arc. And then the performers of it are so good and have done this for so long that it's like, okay, yeah, I know what to do. And they kind of go out and they improvise the story that they, they want to tell. It's a uh, really... Are the dancers telling the story or there's a separate narrator? The dancers are singing and dancing. It's, it's a song and dance uh, and dialogue art form. Yeah. Okay, and then now, so those are examples of Bobali art forms. Yeah, Walter Spees, why, right? Yeah, so now we're going back to 1920, when uh, if anyone speaks Dutch, I'm not going to try and pronounce this. Ah, yes. Can you read that word, though, that term for us in italics? The second line? Wow. Poly club means kingdom. Okay. Uh, part means part means how do you say? Uh, 
No, when the ship goes far distance. No, when we trading. No, no, no. A ship doesn't swim. The ship floats. Sail. 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 A mass pocket is like all to me. Okay. There you go. So I'm glad I didn't attempt to say that word uh, that uh, that because I would have. I have enough trouble. I butcher English. I butcher Indonesian, and I butcher Balinese. So I don't want to butcher another language today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. So the that company, the KP, KPM company, uh, promote at around that time. We're promoting the linkage between Hinduism and the performing arts as paramount to the Balinese culture. That was. That was really their their that was really their like mandate for promoting Bali was performing arts and Hinduism, right? They weren't talking about beaches and you know mountains and jungle and stuff like that. They were talking about performing arts. They were talking about religion, right? That was the basis for what happened. So what ended up happening was people came, intellectuals from all over the world. People came, anthropologists, painters. Uh, ethnomusicologists, right? We got Colin McBee, you know, like we've got all these people that came from all over Mark Mead that we talked about. Anthropologists, Walter Spee is a painter and anthropologist, right? Like it was a <coughs> it was a really amazing time for Bali when this was happening. You know, all these people were coming as intellectuals to number one, people that had money. Their money could go a very long way living here. Number two, it was like kind of doing the, the, a grand tour. You now they had the concept of the grand tour going all around Europe. Well, you got to go to Asia, and it was a lot less expensive than doing the grand tour of Europe. And it was being in Bali, being amongst this exotic culture, getting to see all of these performing art forms and all of these other art forms that don't exist anywhere in Europe. It was considered a very, uh, a very interesting place for intellectuals to go, and it still is, right? Like, look at all of us here, you know, like, that's why we're here. We're, 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 we're not an intellectual. <laughs> well, you know, we are, you know, like, we try to be at least, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying, right? <laughs> I'm trying. But, yeah, it, it, it has been since then, right? And it, that's when things kind of changed, and it wasn't like uh, the subjugation of the Balinese people in, in terms of the, the colonialism so much as it was, this was a place where people could go and kind of study. People could go and people could go and practice what they what they learned in theory, right? Like anthropologists could go and you know kind of it was yeah like a lab, right? Like and it was an interesting it was an interesting time at the time. And then so we have Walter Spees. He was noticing this stuff and he was talking to the people in the village of Budulu. And at that time saying, you know, like, well, listen, this is only going to get bigger and bigger, right? And he was right, you know, like, what is it? It's uh, 100 years later, right? <laughs> 100 years later, he was right. It's going to get bigger and bigger. And he goes, well, let's sell some shit, right? Yeah, it's like, let's let's sell some shit, you know? Like, and not just, like, make, not, not just, like, sell you, sell people things you own, but, like, let's sell some arts, right? Like, let's come up with something here. So with the people of Budulu, they designed Kechak and designed Kechak to be using Ramayana and Mahabharata in stories, usually standard Ramayana stories, and they took it from the Sanhyang dance. So that was an that was an adaptation, or sorry, an appropriation, an appropriation of the Sanhyang dance because it wasn't an adaptation because an adaptation involves a change in media, right? So it was an actual appropriation of the Sanhyang dance, but. At least they weren't just selling Sanyang, right? They weren't just like what happened with the Rajan thing that went off, right? They weren't just saying, yeah. So what is the main difference between so uh, Sanya is Bali? Or yeah, yeah. Or, or Bali? Wali. Wali. In some places, yes. And to call it Ketchak is uh, the Bali Baliang. Bali Bali, Bali Han, yeah. Ketchak is Bali Bali Han. Uh, and they changed the name of it. They took the same techniques and the vocalizations of stuff that you see in Sanyang dance, and then what they did was they, and then what they did was they worked it worked it around a Ramayana theme, and they, they came up with yeah, uh, an, an appropriation of Sanyang to become a new art form. The content is different, but the style of the. Same, yeah. Just the stories. Yeah, the stories change and the dance movements are changed. Yeah, and. Most importantly, the connotation was changed. 
the, co the context has changed. Because we have uh, a sacred art form of Sanyan turning into Kechak as Bavali Bali Ha. And it worked well, and it's kind of okay, because yes, it's an appropriation, but Kechak didn't really do, is Kechak didn't do the same thing as selling tickets to a world record setting Rajan dance, right? Like, it's not doing the same thing as that. It's quite, quite different because it's an appropriation and coming up with a new art form. So that's what happened. And then coming back to this presidential uh, instruction number nine, that was kind of based upon making observations about what happened around that time. In 1930, people of Budulu and Walter, Walter Spees had turned Sanghyang into Kechak. But Sanghyang still existed. Most importantly, Sanghyang still exists, right? Sanghyang didn't go away. Sanghyang stays as uh, Upakara, as a ceremony unto itself, but Kechak comes into existence. Whereas the Rajan Sandak Rakusagara, it wasn't a ceremony unto itself, it was just a thing happening, and even though it's supposed to be a ceremony unto itself. So whose idea was this? Was this good? A committee of people from the Walter Spies, right? It was oh, that was the people. Walter Spees and the people of Budulu kind of working together. Because Walter Spees having the idea of well, let's sell some stuff, and then saying, well that's really cool art form that people like, it's really exciting and people would really like to see, you know, let's take that and come up with something new from it, right? Because I'm sure what happened at the time is that people said, well, we can't do that. That's ceremony. That's sacred to us, right? Like, it's okay. Well, let's take the idea of that and come up with something new. And then they go, oh, okay, yeah. So it wasn't a Walter Spies that said, okay, this is Ubi Ubi Dan, this is Jack Blue, and this is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Walter Spies wouldn't have known that, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, he was the one that kind of told the people, well, you can sell this if you do this with it, right? Where is he from? Walter Spee's Dutch. No, he's Austrian. He's Austrian? Oh, I thought he was Dutch. Well, there you go. Walter Spee's is Austrian. So yeah. I, I think he's Dutch. I don't know. I, yeah, no, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I just, I'm just questioning. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm willing to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, could be. <laughs> well, he born German. in Russia. Russian, Russian born in German. Okay, but he came with the Dutch. That's fact. <laughs> Thought he was Dutch, yeah. But he did come over with this. Uh, was, can you say the name of the company again? Wow. Koneka. Gold, gold uh, it's like a royal. Baka Baka Mas Mas Okay. Oh, and I have to say it in the sale. Okay. Oh, and I have to say it in the sale. Okay. Good. Cool. Okay. Yeah, trading company. Yeah. Yeah, trading company. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Around that time. Indonesia was called the Dutch East Indies, yeah. right? It wasn't known as Indonesia, it wasn't the country at the time. It was called the Dutch, the Dutch East Indies. So, I mean, Bali wasn't Indonesia, it was just like a colony, right? Like, to these people. You know, like Bali was Bali, as Bali has always been. Okay, so now change, yeah, we're talking about change, and, yeah, where the way things, the way things evolve, right? And yeah, as uh, Officer Ramasara mentions in the paper, the structural concept in structural theory is really the way to think about this, right? Because it refers to Balinese cultural structure that adheres to religion and traditional performing arts, as far as functions, are considered in reference to the continuity of Balinese cultural structures and the discontinuities of Balinese cultural structures. So we have these continuities of Sanyang, still say Sanyang, right? And then the discontinuity is this evolution of Kachak as a new art form, right? But Sanyang still says Sanyang. That's the most important part. And then we have another discontinuity. This Rajan Sandaratu Sugara is a dance that is considered sacred. Even though it's a newer creation, it's still considered a Rajan dance. However, 
the discontinuity is using it out of its context. And then you get this mass trance that happened for months as a, maybe as a result of that. I don't know if you could scientifically prove that, but it's a... Maybe it's important to know if that's, what, that's the reason people are ascribing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That may be all we get to know. Yeah, and that, and that, that may be enough as, as, a, as a qualitative observation. Yeah. Uh, so that's the way to look at this, right? Cultural interaction with outside cultures pulls strong implications of change in Bali, like why people are thinking that this K-pop is going to destroy things, right? So it's, it's not, but because there's a tradition of outside cultures impacting Bali. Bali is very cultures impacting Bali. Bali is a very hybrid culture, right? Like it adopts other cultures very, very well. Like, look at the influence of of uh, Buddhism on Balinese Hinduism, right? And like, you can see that everywhere throughout Balinese Hinduism. It's like this adaptive mindset is the Balinese the Balinese mindset. These people can adapt and assimilate other cultures into their own, rather than losing their own culture by assimilating to another culture, right? So, which is you know, as we spur uh, a form of cultural transformation from the feudal and agrarian culture to the culture of the tourism industry, which is where we are now. So the impact of tourism, it's very feasible that this transfer, transformation uh, and impact of tourism is influential on the Balinese people, uh, as it says here. Expansion and employment, uh, expansion of employment opportunities, improvement of per capita perceptions, and increasing creativity in the fields of art and culture, especially in the performance art. All of these influences have caused a very strong material impulse, which did not exist because in the days of Gambu, these guys were not thinking of very strong material impulse. They were thinking of doing what they do, going around and performing their art form, and oftentimes it was a barter system, right? They were fed, given a place to stay, treated well, maybe people would give them artifacts, people would give them grain, right, to take home with them, and they would bring that home when they were done on their tour, right? It was, it was more of a barter system at that time. But now it's a very strong material impulse. It's incessant commercialization, right? Like we can see with the Rajang Sandat Ratu Sugara happening, right? That is, that is uncontrolled. That is uncontrolled and unmitigated commercialization on the part on the part of the the regency of Tabanan it happened, and because they didn't think of it that way, they just wanted to promote themselves, which is very understandable, right? And then uh, then we have the development of the individualistic mentality, and there's a citation there because that is yeah that's something that has been an outside influence from going from a communal system and going to an individual mentality. It, it has been a product of, that is a product of the tourism industry or a side effect of the tourism industry here. So uh, the issue of commodification of performing arts for commercial purposes, which occurs not only in the performing arts grouped in the art of Bali Bali Han, but also occurs in the art of, in the arts of Wali. So that's when it becomes difficult because kind of, you know, you can think of step by step, right? You can go, this is just one step over there, right? But when we do this, it's like, whoa, that's a long way to go. But you gotta really stretch your imagination for some of these art forms where it, it can't happen, right? And that's why they had this seminar in 1971, March 26th and 25th, to make sure that some of them that they don't do that with everything, right? We keep some things sacred, right? We don't secularize everything. It's important. So this article that I was trans that I translated and we're kind of unpacking, this is all unpacking the article by Pakistan is uh, case studies Ketchak and Baron. We've talked a lot about Ketchak, so we're not gonna keep going on Ketchak. It's kind of throughout the whole article is talked about Ketchak. And then we've seen how it's undergone these changes. And then Varong has undergone commercialization and commodification. And it's changed from a Wali art form to a Bali Bali Han art form also. But that's so, still very sacred. Still very, the Bali Bali Han version of it 
No, but the Wali version of it is still very sacred. So what's the difference there? Because like with Ketchak, they changed the name. Yeah, they changed the name of the Baron one also. They called it Baron and Chris. They called it, they came up with it in Matubulan, I believe it started. Or, yeah, I believe it started in Matubulan. They started these Baron and Chris dances, and they sell tickets to it, and it's a tourist art form. And we're, we're going to get into that. So we have the Kachak fire dance in Uluwatu that. This is a pretty good one of it because there's lots of people there, and it seems like it's pretty. Exciting. But yeah, so Sanghem and Kachak, it uh, <coughs> was commercializing the Kachak. But also, the pro one problem is that in Ubud, what has happened, not just in Ubud, but very often you'll see in Ubud, they'll have a Sanghem Jaran dance where they didn't change the name. They kept Sanghem, Sanghem Jaran, and they just start selling tickets to it. Right? That becomes problematic, especially for. Uh, the author of this article, it's, uh, it's kind of, you know, that's a problematic aspect because that is not acknowledging that it's Wally. It's just kind of saying, okay, now we have this art form sign and we're going to sell tickets to it. It's, it does become, yeah, I can see why you could, why you would argue it becomes problematic. I mean, it's a, it's a sacred, it's a sacred art form. And so this is just a, a little bit about it. And I mean, in Ubud, I guess people can get away with that in Ubud because Ubud is just like, since 1930, lots of tourism, right? Like it's been a very, it's been a tourist hot spot for a long time. And I mean, they can kind of, I don't want to say anything that's going to get me in trouble, you know, like they can kind of do it if they want, I suppose. Because it's a very popular tourist hot spot, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. And then now we're talking about yeah, about from moving from Barong to Barong and Chris dance. So we have many types of Barong. What's interesting about Barong is it's also considered Sun Sunat, which is healing. It's a type of healing for the community. Barong is not just a dance, not just a performing arts, but like you'll see when. Barong is being, when they take the Barong and they walk around the village with it, you've seen that, right? They are using it as Sun Sunan, it's healing the community. For example, in where I live in Nungu, uh, some strange things were happening over the course of six months, I believe it was. A body got dumped in a ditch, or like a gutter, right? So some, they found the people who did it. It was people from Paranasa, murdered a guy from Sumba and dumped the body in a gutter, gutter in Mungu, right? And the body was found. A guy from my banyard and his son got in a dispute with the guy over some money owed, gambling debts, beat him up, the guy ended up dying in the hospital. And then another guy from Mungu, from another banyard, over gambling debts, went to a guy's house to collect the gambling debt and ended up getting murdered by the guy. So, I mean, there was three murders that had relation to Nungu at that time. And what the Bindesa Adat decided was they had to undergo Sun Sunga, right? They had to use the Barong, and they assigned every Banya in Nungu, all, uh, all 14 of them. They, decided, they assigned every Banya in Nungu, and they decided, okay, you will have this day where you go around and you use for all the people in your Banya, you go around, you purify their homes, and do that with the Barong, right? So this is like a form of, a form of healing for the people more than just a uh, dance because they're just carrying the barong. They're not dancing the barong when they're doing that. And then as uh, the article says, it's considered uh, used when necessary to ward off disease outbreaks. So I'm saying that it's, this, is my, this is my bit. I'm saying it's not just to ward off disease outbreaks. The reason why in 1920 to ward off disease outbreaks was because, I mean, think of colonialism and all of the diseases they would bring to the island, right? Like that people didn't have immune systems for. So of course there would be disease outbreaks and they would use the Baron as a form of healing for that, but it's beyond just disease outbreaks. It's for healing the community in terms of healing the mentality of the community, right? As a reminder to the people of the community, like in Nungu, you know, like hey, maybe 